Our loving and eternal Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we have gathered here together to bring glory and honor and praise and worship to Thee. To commit ourselves, Lord, once again to the service of Jesus. To examine our hearts and to see, Lord, where we lack, that we might come and rise higher and indeed be as soldiers in the army of Jesus to honor and glorify His name. As we open Thy word now, Father, we pray and ask that Thou wilt grant us thy spirit in a rich measure, that we might not only understand the word, but that, um, that it might bring a change in our lives. I pray that thou be with me as I speak, Lord, that thou grant me the right words, and that thy promise of thy spirit to bring conviction upon all hearts might be present here. Please shut us in with thine angels, we pray, dear Lord. We have a desperate need for the pouring out of thy spirit. We have a desperate need for a deeper change in our hearts. And we have a desperate desire to be ready for when Jesus comes soon to take us home. This is our prayer now and to this end we thank thee for hearing us because we ask it in the powerful and mighty name of our Savior and our Commander, Jesus. Amen. The title of our study this morning is Soldiers and Banners, of course, as the theme is Standing Under the Bloodstained Banner of Prince Emmanuel. It portrays imagery of battle, warfare, soldiers, and everything that is engaged with that. And as I've, as I've been contemplating that theme, I was reminded uh, how many times in the scriptures the Christian life and the Christian journey is portrayed in language of warfare and battle so many times and there is a reason for that and the reason is there is a war going on and it would do us well to be reminded and remind each other of this fact because many times we take it easy a little bit or forget that there is a battle going on and sometimes we need to urge each other and remind each other to uh, press forward in this battle of course, if we were to think in this world's terms, nobody entering an army in a time of war would think that he is entering in upon a time of ease and relaxation or a time of holiday. That is not the expectation. Rather, they know that they will face hardships, they will face toil, they will have to endure difficulties, they will have to eat coarse food at times, perhaps even rationed, not as much as they would like. They would have to endure long weary marches by day and the heat of the burning sun sometimes. Many times they will have to endure camping out at night under the open sky and maybe even exposed to drenching rain, to chilling frost, to all kinds of different difficulties in the elements. And they venture health and life. And all the while, while they're in the army, all the while, they are the targets of the enemy. This is what is expected when a soldier joins an army. And it's interesting that the Christian life is compared to soldiers in an army. And it would be a great fallacy for us to expect a life of ease and enjoyment while we are in the Christian army. There is a spiritual battle going on. And this Christian battle, this conflict, calls for endurance. It calls for trials and it calls for victories as well. And it will uh, do us well, as I said, to spend this time a little bit to remind ourselves of what it is like to be good soldiers in this army and what it is like to be soldiers who can hold up the right banner in this army of Christ. Because after all, the reward will go not to those in the army who were self-indulgent and at ease, but those who have endured hardness, those who have waged the battle, those who fought under the blood-stained banner. You see, when we say we're standing under the blood-stained banner, it means more than just standing still. We are standing in a position of heavy warfare. So we want to spend some time today looking at the qualities that make up a good soldier. And as we look at some of the qualities that make up good soldiers in the army, in the army of Christ, I want each and every one of you to ask yourself the question, am I a good soldier or not? Am I in possession of these qualities? And I want to challenge each and every one of you today that we might rise higher 
in the service of the master. Because, brothers and sisters, there is a very fierce battle going on. You don't need me to tell you that, but many times we need to remind each other of that. We forget all too often. And we want to see what it is like to be good soldiers in the battlefield. The story is told that uh, one young boy one day received a letter from General Major Baden Powell. The young boy was interested in becoming a soldier. And so the Major wrote him a letter and this is what he said. And in this letter he reveals the first and foremost important quality for a soldier. The for foremost duty, the first duty of a soldier is to be something. This is what he said. One thing you must learn before you can be a good soldier and that is to be very obedient to your superior officers. That is, while you are a boy, to be obedient to your father and to your mother or to your schoolmaster. And when you become a real soldier, you will know how to obey your officers in every little thing. It is no use being a big or strong soldier unless you are an obedient soldier. This is a very important quality. And it's important because, of course, without obedience, the army would very quickly be demoralized. Obedience is something, as it's mentioned here, very uh, well put in the letter, begins in the home. Parents, we all have a duty to teach our children obedience. Why is that? So that they can become good soldiers in the army of Christ. Training for obedience begins in the home. Obedience, following instruction, following orders, following direction of the parents. That is what prepares the young people, the young children, when they are adults, to be good soldiers for Jesus Christ. A lot of the problems that actually exist in the church and among the believers can be traced in part to a lack of ability to obey. Obedience. Very early, we must be able to cultivate obedi obedience. Children, it's very important to learn obedience in the home. Good soldiers begin at home when they're obedient to mommy and daddy. Of course, this is not just for children. Adults as well need to be obedient. But home is the place where we begin. And sometimes this is vital and it can make all the difference for the life of the person in the future. Of course... Obedience is the very first thing that God requires. We know that from the Bible in Exodus chapter 19. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19, we see how the spiritual counterpart, of course, is accurate when it comes to obedience. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, God speaking to the children of Israel, and the very first thing He speaks to them, in calling them a holy people and a nation of priests, He gives them the very first quality that they needed to have. In verse 5 it says, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which, which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And it's important to remember that Peter uses this very same promise and he applies it to the believers. That we are all a kingdom and a nation of priests. A chosen generation. And God says we are so if we obey his voice. Obedience. You remember Adam and Eve, their test was a test of obedience. Will they obey or disobey? This is a very important quality, obedience. This is the duty that parents must teach their children and this is the duty of children to obey. And this is the duty of good soldiers to be obedient soldiers. Soldiers to follow the instructions of the master. I want us to look at the contrast of that because disobedience is a very dangerous matter. And there's an illustration in the Bible of the disastrous results of disobedience. And I want us to look at this verse together, but particularly I want the children and the parents 
to take note of this verse that deals with disobedience, and then we'll see what uh, we can make out of it. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. In Deuteronomy chapter 21. Notice carefully here the disastrous results of disobedience and what consequences they can bring. Deuteronomy 21, we'll begin reading from verse 18 down to 21. Verse 18, it says here, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Isn't that a serious matter? Now, I want to ask you an honest question, parents. How many of you would do that if you were living in Israel? Take your child, lay hold on him, take him to the other, say, this our child, he just does not listen. He is disobedient. Because you know what would happen? They would be stoned. Children, are you listening to that? That's a serious matter. I'm not saying this to scare anyone, but God is illustrating very graphically here the terrible consequences of disobedience. Disobedience brings death. Disobedience brings destruction. Disobedience is really rebelliousness. And so this is why it's vital as parents to take careful heed, pay careful heed to this instruction. Are we teaching our children to be good soldiers, to be obedient? Because if we are not, we are really destining them for a life of difficulty, a life of suffering. Disobedience is really rebelliousness. And rebelliousness in an army is one of the most dangerous things. Many times it's more dangerous than the attacks of the enemy. When there is disobedience among the ranks of the army, that is a very, very dangerous thing. But not only is this recorded for children, this is also recorded for the sake of adults, those of us who do not consider ourselves as children. What does this teach us as adults? in the service of Christ, in the army of Christ, that disobedience brings death. Many times not only to ourselves but to others. To disobey is tantamount to rebellion. And the question to you and me is, are we in this category? Do we obey or are we found disobedient? You know, we just discussed in our last study, the wonderful plan of salvation and the cost or the, we, we looked a little bit into what we could understand of the cost of our salvation what God has done there is great incentive and motivation there for us to obey realizing that Christ has done all this for us like the song says uh, I suffered much for thee more than thy tongue can tell and Jesus says I've done all this for you what hast thou done for me. Isn't that an interesting question? That's the incentive for obedience. Recognizing that. And this is why it's important to examine our hearts. Do we really obey the Lord or do we make excuses? Are we good soldiers who obey or not? A very good illustration of this question is found in the story of King Saul. You remember the king was given instruction by God to go and destroy the Amalekites. And he was given very specific instructions. And uh, Saul, as a soldier in the army of Jesus Christ, thought it wiser to modify God's instruction a little bit and to change it. And he obeyed in part. Isn't that right? He carried out part of the instruction. Let's look at the result of that recorded in 1 Samuel 15. Because many times we can deceive ourselves as Saul did. 
First Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15. Saul was not a young child here, he was an adult. This was the test for Saul, wasn't it? Will he obey the word of the Lord? First Samuel 15, Samuel comes to Saul in verse 22, and he tells him the following, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. And verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord he hath also rejected thee from being king strong words after all Saul did obey and part and this was his excuse wasn't it he said I did carry out the word of the Lord I fulfilled it there's only just these few people and these animals that we spared he had spared the king and a few choice animals. The question is to you and me, do we make excuses like Saul when it comes to obedience? Do we obey in part, or modify the Lord's instruction, and make excuses comforting ourselves that we are really carrying out God's instruction? This is a dangerous deception. The words of Samuel, we should well heed. Are we good soldiers who obey, or are we making excuses you see this extends to all things because the commander of the army has given us instruction that is designed for our optimum performance in the spiritual battle he has given us clear directions in many areas of life I won't go through every th single detail but we are all well aware that God has told us in his testimonies of what we should eat and what we should not eat instruction for optimal performance in the battle the question is, are we obedient or not? God has given us instructions what to wear and what not to wear. As Christians in the battle, do we obey or are we like Saul? It's a serious matter because time is running out. And we need to be faithful in not deceiving ourselves into thinking that we're really standing under the banner and that all is well with us. When the very first quality of being a good soldier, obedience, is lacking in our part. You see, in the armies of this world, soldiers are given what to wear, soldiers are given what to eat, soldiers are given where to sleep, and soldiers are told what to do all day. And obedient soldiers get with the program. How much more would we expect it in the spiritual battle, in the army that we're waging against Satan? Disobedience brings horrible results. Disobedience brings a horrible curse. Deuteronomy chapter 11 spells that out for us. Deuteronomy chapter 11. And you know, in looking at that, I had to confess and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I haven't been very obedient <laughs> as a soldier many times. Obedience is very important. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 to 28. Notice what God says here. It says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in the, into, unto the land whither thou goest in to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Here was a very graphic illustration that God gave the Israelites that they were to carry out even when they were to go into the promised land. But God had given them the choice. He said, I said before you today a blessing and a curse. You choose which one. Here is how you can obtain it. A blessing if you obey. And if you don't, a curse. I am sure we all want the blessing that comes from obedience. And none of us want the blessing that comes from disobedience. As good soldiers, the question is, are we obedient soldiers? You all remember the story of the disobedient soldier in Israel. The disobedient soldier in Israel not only brought disaster upon himself, but he brought disaster upon the whole army. You remember his name? Achan. 
was the disobedient soldier. And he disobeyed in a minor matter, many of us would judge. And yet it not only brought disaster upon himself, but upon others in the camp. This is a beautiful illustration for us. Disobedient soldiers can endanger their fellow soldiers. The same thing happened with Israel when they came to the borders of the land of Canaan and God uh, instructed them to go in. They of course wanted to send in spies. They came back with a report and they said we can't go in because there are giants in the land. God had said go forward. They said we cannot go forward. Disobedience. And what happened? God said okay you need to turn back now. And then what happened? They said, no, we will now go forward. Directly opposite. And they went forward and what happened to them? They were killed. Disobedience to the commands and instructions of the captain of the host can only bring terrible results. All these examples are recorded for us in the scriptures for a reason. They are to teach us and illustrate for us the qualities that we need in the spiritual warfare. In the battle. And so that's why in Romans it says that to whom we yield our servants to obey his servants, we are whom we obey. Servants obey. Good soldiers are obedient soldiers. Another important quality that goes hand in hand with obedience is trust. Trust is a very important aspect. This is another quality. And it's directly linked with obedience because. Disobedience actually shows distrust. When we disobey, we actually demonstrate distrust. Not being faithful. Not trusting completely. And uh, if we were to illustrate it this way, you know, if a soldier was very proud of his weapons and his gear as a soldier, you know, many times they have these uh, military parades. And in the military parade, all the soldiers dress up, you know, and they uh, polish their weapons and everything. And all is spick and span. They look really, really good. They look like a very powerful army. And uh, we would think it's quite a positive sign that these soldiers are all excellent soldiers when it comes to a battle. But, you know, it's a very different thing to parade your armor and your gear in a parade and it's a different matter when the battle is on. What would we think of a soldier as soon as the battle started who would throw away his gear and his weapons and take off in the opposite direction? We think it's a very foolish thing. Or even a soldier who has a very, back in the olden days they used to use shields. That's not very common today. But a soldier who has a mighty shield, as soon as he goes into the battle and the arrows of the enemy begin to fly, he casts his shield aside and he takes off. The very thing that was given to him to protect him. We would think that's a very foolish thing. And yet how many times do we as soldiers throw away our shield? You know, God has given us a shield. What is it? The shield of faith. And we're told the shield of faith is going to do what? Quench how many? All the fiery darts of the wicked one. And yet sometimes we hold on to the shield of faith when all is going well. But as soon as difficulty comes... We, in essence, throw the shield of faith out and all of a sudden we get hit with all these darts of the enemy. Good soldiers need to exercise faith when it's hard, when the going gets tough. That's really where the challenge is. And this is what we are involved in. It's a war. It should not surprise us that we are going to have conflicts with the enemy. God is not giving us the armor so we can operate in a parade. We are not involved in a military parade. We are involved in a battle. The parade is when we get to the kingdom. But right now we have a battle on our hands. We need to trust in the leading of God. That's why the Bible gives us wonderful promises that are qualities for good soldiers. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. And see how this quality is of vital importance as well. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in 
thee. Trust in the Lord. Verse 4, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. God wants us to be good soldiers, obedient soldiers, trusting soldiers. When we disobey, we actually show distrust. Do we trust God's instruction? Do we trust the instructions of the captain enough to actually carry them out? Therein is found everlasting strength. Therein is found the blessing that is promised to be good soldiers, victorious soldiers. It's easy to obey when we trust. Trusting makes obedience easy. To trust the Lord that He really knows all. That in this difficulty, God's instructions, if followed, will indeed bring a blessing. That's trust. It's this trust that is revealed in disobedience. Notice how this is brought out in Zephaniah. The book of Zephaniah, Old Testament minor prophet. Towards the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That's where it is. Just at the end there, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Notice how God here clearly brings out the connection and the link between trust and obedience. It says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted, to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Here is a problem. When we disobey, we should actually ask ourselves, am I distrusting the Lord? Have I started to doubt the Lord? That's what disobedience really comes from. Not obeying the voice is not trusting the Lord. Do we really trust the Lord and what He has said? When the going gets tough. That's where the test is. And as good soldiers, we must. I pray that we indeed search our hearts, that we can be good soldiers. That's why the Bible uh, inspires the hymn that we sing called Trust and Obey. Obey. We all sing that, don't we? Now it's one thing to sing it. It's another thing to, to live it. And of course, it will be best sung and it will be music in God's ears when we sing it, when we actually live it. That's what we say in the chorus. It's the only way to be happy in... Jesus is to trust and obey. Good soldiers obey and trust. They trust and obey. This is why in Psalm 56 we have this beautiful promise again. Psalm 56. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. It says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Do we have a hard time sometimes, situations that surround us that are so difficult and trying? What time we are afraid, that's the time to trust. And yet it was, it's at those very times that many times we Cast away our trust. Let us remember to trust in God, particularly when the going gets tough. Because brothers and sisters, it will get tough. And it will get tougher. It's now that we need to learn and utilize this. So that we can indeed say with David, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Remember Job when he was tried? He went through a hard experience. I wonder many times if we put ourselves in Job's shoes. If we go through an experience like Job went through how many of us would behave like Job behaved have you ever thought of that it's quite a sobering illustration what did Job say though he slay me yet will I trust in him good soldiers trust and they trust when the going is tough when it is hard the story is told that one day a unit of soldiers was stranded in a battle and they were in a very difficult situation. They were surrounded by enemies and they needed an urgent airlift. And the airlift needed to happen quite quickly so that the anti-aircraft missiles would not take the aircraft down. The word came to the commander of the unit, said, hold tight, we'll be there, sh we'll be there shortly, be ready for a quick exit. And so the commander told his soldiers, everybody needs to be ready for a quick exit. And they waited that day. 
nothing happened. They waited the next day, nothing happened. They waited for a few days, nothing happened. They were waiting for the quick exit. The commander did not cease to encourage his soldiers to always be ready for a quick exit. He said, any day they're coming. They said they're coming. And sure enough, after a few weeks, where every day the soldiers would have all their gear ready to move out at short notice, sure enough, at an unexpected hour, the airlift came, and all the soldiers made it in on time, and they were out very quickly without any damage. What made all the difference was they were ready. They had trusted the instruction that came. They tr trusted the instruction that there would be help. And they are to make ready for a quick exit. Isn't it the same with us? Isn't that what Jesus says? Be ready for a quick exit. I am coming soon. Do we really trust what he has to say? Are all our bags packed for the trip, so to speak? Are we ready to move? Do we trust or not? This is what our commander has said. Qualities for good soldiers. As we're looking at that, I just want us to think how it is with you and me. Another important quality that is, again, an outflow of what we're talking about is a quality that has to do with facing difficulties. And this is a quality that's called courage. Courage is a word that's made up of two Latin words, which literally means a strong heart or a heart that acts. You know when you're afraid, your heart starts fluttering and... Uh, and you get this fearful uh, feeling. Courage is the opposite of that. Courage is to face difficulty valiantly. Courage and confidence are vital qualities for good soldiers. The fact that you need courage immediately implies that there is difficulty, that there is danger, that there is problems that will be faced for which courage is needed. A person who does not have confidence and courage cannot face difficulty. We will fail when it comes to difficulty. It's important to cultivate courage and strength. How can we cultivate courage and strength in this army? It comes from the commander. It comes from the one leading the battle. Trust in the commander that he is leading through these difficulties will inspire confidence and courage in the battle. Distrust of the commander will demonstrate itself not only in disobedience, but in our hearts failing us when the test comes upon us. You know how many times we have a difficulty and our hearts just fail us and our courage gives way and we just plummet. I think we can all relate to that. What happened in those situations is that we have taken our eyes off the commander of Jesus. Our courage falters. Only the courageous can conquer difficulties. That's why we must have this quality by looking to the captain. Notice what it tells us in Proverbs 3, this beautiful, beautiful promise. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 26. Actually, let's read from verse 24 down to 26. Proverbs 3, verses 24 to 26. It says, When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Here is where our confidence is. The Lord is our confidence. The commander is our confidence. He will keep us from being taken. This is trust. This is faith in the commander. It inspires this courage that only God can inspire to face spiritual difficulties. Now I think we all know and can attest that it is impossible to face spiritual difficulties and trials on our own and conquer. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many times we have experienced the impossibility of that. But it is vitally important to understand that only through Christ can we conquer. Only by having His confidence 
by making the Lord our confidence. That's why it's important to remember that we are soldiers in the army and we receive from our commander not only instruction, but confidence, courage. You know, if you study history, one of the greatest commanders in uh, battles in history was Alexander. And uh, historians have affixed to his name the word the great. Of course, that wasn't the name his father gave him. It was Alexander, but we know him as Alexander the Great. The reason why he's known as Alexander the Great is because he was a mighty commander in battle. His army going into battle with him would be inspired with confidence and courage, so much so that they would win every battle under his command. And it had the very opposite effect on the enemy. You know, the soldiers of Alexander... They would go from one victory to the next. After a while, they started looking forward to battles, knowing that if Alexander is at the head, they're going to win. What an attitude to go into a battle with. Courage. No matter how much the enemy had more than them, no matter how much resources the enemy had, they had courage and confidence because they had a good commander. Now, our commander is Christ, the greater than Alexander. He has never lost a battle. And going into battle with him should inspire us with confidence, great confidence, knowing that we are not possibly going to win, perhaps that we are already victorious because he has defeated the enemy. We just looked at the beautiful victory that Christ obtained for us on the cross. That should inspire us with courage. Good soldiers are courageous soldiers. They get that from Christ. Notice how this is a vital component of our strength in Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Confidence and courage. Isaiah chapter 30. Here's what God says to his people. A very powerful verse. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15. It says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. But Israel says, And ye would not. Will that be said of us? Or not? The decision is ours. In quietness and in confidence is our strength. Strength is in confidence in the commander. And there are many, many promises in the scriptures that deal with this. Let's just look at a couple more. Notice how Paul brings this out. This is a vital component. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews, New Testament, chapter 3. And verse 14. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. And here we're told, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We're partakers if we hold the beginning of our confidence until the very end. That means confidence is needed all along the battle, all the way to the end. Confident soldiers. Confident soldiers are the ones who win the day. That's why a little later in the book it says, Cast not away therefore your... Confidence. Don't throw it away. Because it hath great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence. Difficulties will come. There is no question about that. And we're going to see that in a minute. Don't throw away your confidence at the very time when you need it the most. Look to the commander who is leading the battle. Christ is at the head of the battle. That's why we're also told that we are confident of this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you, will what? Perform it until the day of Jesus. He will finish what he has started. Are we confident of that? That should inspire us with zeal, with great courage to do exploits for God. We have beautiful examples of that in the scriptures. Looking at such a commander should inspire us with great zeal to uh, accomplish great things for God. You know, someone said it really well. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. You know, I read that once and I really pondered that and I, and I thought, I thought, wow, what a beautiful, beautiful gem. That is so true. Expect great things from God 
and based on that attempt great things from uh, for God you know we have examples in the scriptures of people who did that they expected great things from God and they attempted in the courage of the commander and they achieved the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer comes to mind you remember the whole army of Israel was quaking because the Philistines were out in strength so much so that the Israelites thought it would be more uh, it would be safer for them to hide in the rocks and in the caves. But Jonathan and his armor bearer had a different idea. Jonathan knew that the commander of the armies of Israel was the Lord God himself. And he told his armor bearer, listen, we need to do something. And they prayed. And I think we all remember the story. Together, just the two of them went up into the camp of the Philistines. And the Bible says that the camp of the Philistines was discomfited. They gave way. Two men, they expected great things from God and they made an attempt for God. And God rewarded their courage and their confidence. How is it with us when it's all dark all around us? It's good to remember the example of Jonathan and his armor bearer. It's not only him. You remember the story of David? He went up against Goliath. We all know the story of David and Goliath. It's a good story. Young children love it. Uh, and adults love it too. The story of David and Goliath is a story of spiritual courage in the spiritual battle. Do we go up against the giant? Same thing, the army of Israel was all as far as they could be from Goliath. Here was their champion, the big uh, bad guy, so to speak, terrorizing the Israelites. And here comes little David. And David had his eyes on the commander of the armies of Israel. He had his eyes on Jesus. And that gave him such courage and confidence to go up against Goliath. Brothers and sisters, we need to accomplish great things in this spiritual battle. There are many Goliaths to knock down. Only the courage that is inspired by looking to the commander can make us be like David. To take up that little stone and knock the commander of the opposition out. There's beautiful examples in history. I like very much reading missionary stories. Uh, recently I read a missionary story, wonderful missionary story about China. Brother Stefan was telling us about China, but this was a few years ago. China was a dark continent, of course, as we read some continents that are heathen. And there was a young man by the name of Hudson Taylor, young man who had heard the call of the heathen. And this young man attempted great things for God. It's a really, really inspiring story. I highly recommend that you read the missionary story of Hudson Taylor. There you will see a fine example of a soldier for Jesus Christ. This young man left England at 20 years old. He left England heartbroken and abandoned by his sweetheart. She wasn't interested in doing any mission work. He had to leave heartbroken. And he went on a five-month journey on a voyage nearly losing his life, arriving finally in China where immediately he was faced with a civil war. He had to learn the language, he had to work in China and one of the greatest missionaries in China to this day is Hudson Taylor. He was a great soldier for Christ. He was looking to the leader and inspired him with courage, with confidence to go and attempt great things for God. Another good quality for good soldiers is that the care and the burden of the soldier is not himself, but it is the mission. It is the battle. The focus of the soldier is not on himself and his own well-being and his own welfare, but the focus of the soldier is on the welfare of the army, of the mission, of the work, the collective work. This is where his primary interest is. We learn this in Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Verses 2 and 3. Romans chapter 15. Verses 2 and 3. And it says there, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Christ pleased not himself. This is a quality for 
good soldiers. How many times we read stories of valiant uh, soldiers in battle that gave up their life and sacrificed themselves for the good of their comrades. Christ pleased not himself. Are we in this battle pleasing ourselves? This is not a quality of good soldiers. Good soldiers please not themselves. We need to examine our hearts carefully. Let's look at how much this means. Not pleasing ourselves is really another way of saying self-sacrificing. Let's look at the example of Paul in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And verse 24. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Acts 20, 24. Notice how this wonderful description of this quality is portrayed. It says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, Neither count I my life dear unto myself. This is a quality of good soldiers. Do not please themselves. They do not consider themselves. They are self-sacrificing. We all know the verse in Revelation. It says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And what else? And they loved not their lives unto the death. Self-sacrificing. To think of others. To think of the welfare of the mission. The welfare of the battle as a whole. Because we are in this together. You know, sometimes it's easy to think that we are self-sacrificing. We're going to look a little closer in uh, our next part when we finish this as to how we can manifest this. But for now, I just want us to focus on what we have covered so far. I want us to truly ask the question, are we good soldiers of Jesus Christ? Do we have the qualities that make good soldiers? They can only be obtained in one way. They can be only obtained from one place by being truly changed by beholding the person of Christ, by beholding the love of Christ. It will encourage us to be obedient soldiers, to love Him, to trust Him, to have confidence and courage to attempt great things for God because there is great accomplishments waiting to be performed. There are great enemies to be destroyed. Enemies in our lives, personal uh, Goliaths in our lives to overcome, but collectively, the Goliaths of the world. Very soon God's people are going to have to meet the enemy with no uh, softening barrier. The Bible calls it a time of trouble such as never was. Now is the time to prepare for that. Now is the time in these small battles. And we think some of these battles are really hard and they are great battles. But compared to what is coming they are small battles. They are the place where we are to train to be good soldiers for Jesus Christ. I pray that uh, you will take this to heart. I challenge you to examine your heart and see, are these qualities uh, in you? Are these qualities things that have been lacking in your experience? And if so, make a recommitment to indeed be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A soldier that will not turn when the battle gets hard. Let us kneel and pray together and make that commitment to the Lord. Our loving and eternal Father in heaven, what a privilege it is indeed to be enlisted as soldiers in an army of which Christ is the head and the commander, the one that goes forth to conquer, conquering and to conquer, who has not lost the battle. Father, we pray, please, thy forgiveness for the times when we have taken our eyes off Jesus, when we have perhaps dishonored him in our experience, in our lives, and have not been good soldiers. But Lord, it is our desire to be indeed good soldiers, to obey Thee, to trust Thee, to have confidence, knowing that strength comes to us from Thee. We pray, please, Lord, that as we are bowed here before Thee this morning, this Sabbath day, as we lift up our hearts in prayer and silently, each one, if it's the desire of their heart, to make a recommitment, Lord, indeed, to make a solid commitment to stand under the banner of Christ, knowing that this is where there will be a battle. 
This is where there will be hardship, there will be trial, there will be turmoil and there will be difficulty. But knowing also, Lord, that right there is the closest place to the commander, to Jesus Christ. May we draw from him strength, may we draw from him wisdom, may we draw from him every good thing that he has come to give us. Please bless us, dear Lord, for we are in desperate need of thy blessing. We do not even conceive of what is soon to come upon this world. But we know, Lord, that Jesus has promised us and said that we are to be of good cheer because he has already overcome the world. May we indeed be of good cheer as we face the difficulties that seek to steal away our cheer and the joy of our salvation. Cover us, please, Lord, in the hand of Jesus that he said no man can pluck us out of his hand. Help us to remember this promise when we face the difficulty that seeks to accomplish the very thing that Jesus said is impossible to be done to pluck us out of his hand. We thank thee so much because thy promises are faithful and true. And we thank thee for everyone that has come here today. Grandfather, I pray that thy spirit will kindle a fire in our hearts to indeed make us changed by the things that we read, the things we study, the things we behold, that we might be men and women as witnesses, faithful witnesses to thee in these last days. We commit all to thee and we recommit ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen.